Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Denny. I'm Freya. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never had time for, we look at Penguin Highway, a movie where penguins take over the Ministry of Infrastructure. <laughs> <sighs> Denny, I can't read this. <laughs> you can't, you already have it, this is going to stay in. I'm very proud of this one. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm, doing, I'm doing it again though because I hadn't read it when I started talking. <laughs> I, I very much enjoy that you never mistake. read whatever I'm putting there. This is why I keep changing it, Danny. It's like, <laughs> most of the time it's bad. And my one isn't better, but at least I wrote it, so I don't hate myself <laughs> for saying it. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never had time for, we look at Penguin Highway, a movie where penguins take over the Ministry of Infrastructure in Japan. And this week in content warnings, children, lots of them. We hate them. Well, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's the long running joke about me anyway. I actually I actually like children. Uh, oh, don't say that, Ian. You hate children in media. A little bit. But before hmm. we get into it, what have we been doing at the week? I've been doing jack all because I've been <laughs> busy with work. I mean, it's been four days since we recorded the other episode. <laughs> yes. Spoilers. <laughs> like like in fa- okay, in fairness, I am working my way slowly through like four books at the same time. Uh, the only one of which an- is anime related is uh, Otaku Japan's Database Animals uh, by Hiroki Azuma. I'll have more to say about that in like two weeks or whenever I get around to finishing it. But how about you guys? <laughs> I've just been working on my uh, university project. The only thing I've, I've really did in the last four days is I played a bunch more Hades, which is still my game of the year so far. And I'm looking forward to playing uh, Yakuza 7 at some point. And with that said, Jenny, tell us about the movie. The movie was released in August 2018 and was based on a novel by Tomihiko Murimi, the author of Tatami Galaxy, Night is Short, Walk on Girl, and Eccentric Family, all of which have some really great anime adaptations. Eccentric Family specifically was one of my personal favorite shows of uh, 2013. The novel won the prestigious Nihon SF Taisho Award in 2010. And only two of his works, this and uh, Night is Short, Walk on Girl, have been published in the West. The movie was made by Studio Colorido, a fairly new studio which was only founded in 2011, and so far has made mostly only movies and some ONAs, original net animations, including Pokemon Twilight Wings, which I think was quite uh, popular, Ian. I liked it, and so did the Pokemon community. Pokemon community is generally very positive on the current uh, anime. That's good. They made Burn the Witch, which I think a few episodes I said I quite enjoyed. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And the Netflix movie A Whisker Away, which I haven't seen yet. There was also a three-volume manga adaptation released in 2018 and 2019. The director, Hiroyasu Ishida, in an interview together with Morimi, states that he read the that he read the novel at university and really enjoyed it, though he never thought he'd be the one to adapt it. There's a bunch of other interesting details we learned from this interview, such as Marima originally turning down the adaptation once until uh, they, he had the director heavily revise it and send it back to him, then he accepted it, or some notes on the main character's design, but we'll talk more about that later. For now, we go to Ian with the summary. That sounds like a news report. Now we go to Ian with the weather. Now live to... This just in, Michael. Apparently, some jerks are being dicks down at the pond. More on this story as it develops. Da da da. Uh, that was me stalling for time while I bring up the tab. Because <laughs> I was I I was on suck. <laughs> I'm gonna try and condense it. I've tried to condense it down as much as I can. Uh, so I'm gonna skip out whole chunks of the show and just focus on the mysteries because the movie is centered around uh, several mysteries, which. Spoilers are interlinked. Uh, spoilers for the thing I'm about to spoil. <laughs> uh, okay. but So yeah, we start the anime in your typical Japanese town where nothing bad ever happens. Trademark sign. So it's the talk of the town when a bunch of penguins appear in an empty field in the middle of the town. Our main character, Aoyama, and I'll just say everyone is only referred to by their last name in the show. Well, he loves science and he's interested in researching the mystery of the penguins. Why did they appear in my town? They shouldn't be in Japan, they should be in Antarctica. But also the mystery of the lady who works at the dentist's office. A perhaps less uh, scientific (laughs) research project. (laughs) So there's a lot of summer holiday hijinks in this show. A lot of it is Aoyama and his friend Uchida playing slash researching, in your quotes, until 
one day the lady reveals that she can create penguins out of objects what happens is she throws a can up in the air and it turned into a penguin and this obviously fascinates Aoyama he's eager to find out more but when he tries to experiment with the lady to figure out how her powers work they all end in failure this particular mystery doesn't get any real progress until Uchida finds a penguin on the top of the school that he calls the penguin penta and the mystery is that the penguin doesn't seem to eat anything he tried giving it fish he tried giving it onigiri i guess so they figure let's take this to an aquarium the next town over that'll that'll lighten up but on the train the penguin falls ill and eventually turns back into a can of soda uh, <laughs> and eventually turns back into a can of cola the next time that aoyama meets with the lady uh, we learn that she can create other animals specifically bats when it's dark and this is what leads Aoyama to deduce that the penguins are only created when it is sunny. So a new mystery then gets introduced from his classmate, uh, Hamamoto. Uh, she invites him to a field that's beyond the forest in town, and there's a mysterious floating ball of water, which she calls the sea. They try a bunch of different things to research it. They try measuring it. They try drawing it. They throw in a quote-unquote Lego research vessel. Um, <laughs> Their happiness isn't to last. The bully in of the school bully Suzuki comes with his goons, and well, makes up makes a, an asshole of himself. But uh, Hamamoto is like, well, you can't tell anyone. It's our research project. Blah blah blah. Kid stuff. The lady also arrives with some penguins in tow, and uh, these penguins start attacking the sea. This is what triggers Aoyama to conclude that the mysteries have to be connected because the penguins are. Uh, well, they're attacking the they're attacking a big puddle of water. That's not that's not right. But he can't quite say yet how they're how they're connected. This is kind of marks a turning point in the film. There are other adult researchers searching for things in the forest, um, prompted by Hamamoto's dad, who is a researcher, and he's been reading her notes. Um, there's also news about weird happenings. Street lights and vending machines are going missing. Things are getting chopped in half. This makes the whole situation regarding the lady seem a lot more serious. And so she takes this opportunity to make good on a promise to take Aoyama to visit her hometown. Uh, but like Penta earlier, she gets sick once they leave the town. And I think it's actually at the same stop. Uh, she like mm -hmm. is like, feel Luke seems really sick. She's like crying and her tears start to morph into weird creatures called Jabberwocks. She also says she hasn't eaten, I think, in three days at that point. Yes, uh, which was also uh, relates back to Penta in that the, that penguin also hadn't been eaten. So these Jabberwocks start appearing all over town and Suzuki and his goons manage to capture like a baby one and they make a big show of it to the class. Uh, by this point, the holidays are over and some scientists have like heard about this somehow so they arrive at the school and they enlist the bullies with their research the sea meanwhile is expanding in size and causing havoc with the weather patterns in the town and the town is placed on a typhoon alert so now we reach the climax of the film the whole town is it, well the whole town it seems is evacuating to the school to deal with this quote-unquote typhoon and the researchers including Hamamoto's dad have gone missing so the gang teams up with the bullies to escape from the lockdown but in the end, only Aoyama gets free and he goes to see the lady. This is where he explains his like big solution to the mysteries. The sea is a hole in the world and the penguins are trying to repair the hole in the world by destroying it. And she has came from the other side, wherever that may be. And like this is the source of quote unquote penguin energy, which is why she doesn't need to eat. <laughs> So the lady creates an army of penguins, like just by walking along and throwing shit, things turn into penguins around her. And they enter the sea on like a wave of penguins in an attempt to rescue Hamamoto's dad and the other researchers. Once they pass through the sea, they find the lady's home in this uh, strange non-Euclidean world and rescue the researchers. The lady commands the penguins to tear the sea apart. It pops. Everyone is free. And that's it, right? Well, almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aoyama and the lady have to have the talk, uh, where Aoyama realizes that she'll be gone for good, uh, but he resolves that he's going to grow up and solve the mystery and find her again. That's it. <laughs> 
Like, Ian has mostly framed this plot uh, summary through the mysteries, because that's kind of how the plot moves on. But the mysteries themselves really aren't that important. That's not what the movie is about. I mean, yes and no, right? The, the mysteries are the lens through which we view all of the actions. It's 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 a quote-unquote coming-of-age story. There There's a lot of mm-hmm. um, just be children being children, but everything in the show is is like centered around these things happening. Yeah, but they really could have been kind of any supernatural mysteries. Like the fact that there isn't really a resolution to the lady's plot, like we never really learn who she is. We re- we really know very little about her. That doesn't really matter because it's more about Aoyama and how he views her. Like the entire movie, as Ian has said, is really Aoyama's uh, coming of age story. So I think that's really where we should start with Aoyama himself. He's a young kid around eight, eight, and we start the movie with him giving like a big self-confident narration where he just reiterates how smart he is. He is literally counting down the days until he's an adult, about 3,800, I think. So we can reasonably assume he's about age eight. And he's like, oh man, uh, I'm going to have such a great future and I'm sure lots of girls will want to marry me once I've grown up. But ha, shame on them, I've already got somebody. Then he's... uh... Tone is completely opposite to the performance, but that's okay. <laughs> he, I mean, I am not an actor in any way. It's much less arrogant than that. It's more of a kind of childish self-assurance that he's in control of his own world. I mean, he has the 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 rose-tinted Dunning-Kruger effect of not knowing enough about the world to know how little he knows. He's very convinced that he has the n- knowledge of any random adult out there, which is clearly not true. <laughs> I don't think it'd be unfair to describe Ayama as, quotation marks, science boy. Like, he's uh, very scientifically minded. He carries around a bunch of notebooks in which he writes down all of the observations, draws conclusions. When he they first see the penguins, like, it turns out he has, like, spy glasses in his backpack to observe. Uh, his room is plastered full with posters and books all about various uh, fields of study that he can learn from. And we also learn throughout the movie that it's kind of his way of connecting with his father, who also seems to be a scientist. One of my favorite scenes from the film is one of the conversation between him and his father, where we see that both of them carry around very similar notebooks. It's funny because we really know like nothing about his dad, uh, other than these mm-hmm. interactions, like they are framed around like an empirical mindset of the world. Like, here's how you get a eureka moment. Blah 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 blah. He's definitely yeah. a fan of science, but how but he how scientifically minded he is, I guess, is up for debate. Um when he discovers the penguins, he's like, ah, well, I've conjectured six probabilities. And like some of them are pretty reasonable, like they've escaped from a zoo. But then again, some of them are less are less so. Like this is the part where you would say, like, they're aliens from outer space, man. I don't know why I did that <laughs> voice. Uh, it's that level of not understanding and about like being interested in how the world works but not real being able to separate science fiction from science fact very well that is endearing in kids and terrifying in adults (laughs) yeah well it's really all about a projection of his personality that's how he thinks he can understand the world because he's unwilling to admit his old childishness even though it's expressed a lot in how he acts. And in one of the earliest scenes, he happens to meet the main bully, Suzuki, at the dentist, and he tells him, like, this lie about how all your teeth are gonna fall out and, like, fungus is gonna grow and it's quite a visually gross scene and really scares him just kind of to get back at him for making kind of fun of him in class. And it's just a very childish thing to do, but he refuses to admit that. Um, And and it's also kind of reflected in in his um in his interaction with the ladies the it's a as we said it's a coming of age story it's all about really his first crush on the lady and he can't really quite put his uh his feelings into words even though he's very observant and he's able to immediately realize that ah Suzuki likes Hamamoto but he can't really realize that Hana, Hamamoto has a crush on him or that he necessarily has a crush on the lady. Let me stop you right there. He he didn't realize immediately that Suzuki had a crush on Hamamoto. That was Uchida, like the the friend character, who definitely seems to be much more of a people person. Oh um, yes, yes, you're right. You're right. But he is quite forthright, though. I will say this for him: like once he gets like chastised, he he like can be like 
he does sort of like reflect on his behavior and be like, well, yeah, I guess I was being childish, blah, 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 which is kind of nice in a way. <laughs> I mean, it works with a scientific mindset in a way, is that like once he's been shown evidence as to what his behavior actually is like, he's able to kind of take that in and say, huh, the facts show that I was behaving childishly, so I must have been behaving childishly, rather than just saying no. He's not really insistent on his... Um, he can admit that he's wrong, which is a rare trait, both in children and in adults. How do you, how do you feel about him, Freya? So, oh, because he's the... I think we said this before, because he's the viewpoint character, it kind of affects the whole tone of the film, which is going to affect your tolerance level <laughs> for the film in general. Uh, particularly his... Um, how do we feel about his ogling? He he is obsessed with the boobs. That is, <laughs> but they spend way too much time in the show talking about boobs and, like, <laughs> actually at one point I think he mentions that he says he only thinks about boobs for thirty minutes a day, and that's that's a little bit too much time. I mean, like he's a kid. I guess he's got nothing else to fill up his time. I mean. I didn't really mind it all that much because it only, you say it's like constant, but it only really takes up like five minutes of a two hour movie. And it's, it's mostly spread out. And most of the time he does get called out on it by other characters. It doesn't really feel that male gazy or pervy. It's more kind of an innocent, uh, childish thing to do uh, in the way the movie presents it. If it's just, it's an object of scientific, like, because he, he does, like, do, he has, like, a whole notebook on it where he conduct, he does, like, drawings and studies and things. He's just trying to understand his own feelings and his own feelings of fascination. Like, all the same, like, there's a lot of nice things to be said about, about the lady who, I'm, I wish they'd given her an, an actual name. Because, like, he's fascinated with more than just this part about her. Um, but I always find the way he phrases it to be slightly off. Like when he explains how like like the miracle of genetics that brings the perfect woman to him at this yes. time. <laughs> yes, that was a bit odd. And it was just uh my head. It felt like yeah, that specific scene he was being written several years older than he was, but oh mm. well. So but one of the interesting things I think is um that because she's at a dentist, I get the feeling that this like because he, he spends like a good portion of the film just playing around with one tooth, like wobble, wobble, wobble. And I definitely feel that they they really wanted to make a big deal out of the teeth thing, like having the father explain about like the importance of brushing the teeth and then. But it felt a little out of place at times. But maybe this is his way of like getting closer to her. Not is well, he's not seeing enough time with her when she's teaching him how to play chess better. But well, I need to see her more, so I'll just wobble this tooth more and maybe I'll go to the dentist office and annoy the bully. At the same time, we, we can easily like breathe it as a metaphor of it's like the baby tooth that's maybe his final, last like baby tooth that's lost, or milk tooth, whatever it's called. And now he's kind of more of an adult. He's matured a little bit more, just he keeps growing up. I, I get where you're trying to go with that, and I think that that would have worked if it wasn't like a canine that was coming out like it's it's like only like halfway around if it was like one of his like molars then sure which is weird because like suzuki is apparently in to get a wisdom tooth removed and at the age of nine that seems a little early to me so i, I didn't pay enough attention to the translation because i only saw i only saw the film twice <laughs> um but maybe they that was just like a, they figured that was a better translation but Mm-mm. whatever that that seemed really weird to me it's just like is everyone just losing their teeth at weird rates in this school? Uh, another thing that I quite liked about uh, Ariam as a character was the fact that he's not a loner. Because this kind of scientifically minded, very self-assured character could easily have been uh, in a different story. He could have been in, like isolated in the class. Just I don't think there's too much to say about Uchida. He's like the best friend character. He's just kind of getting roped into all the schemes. Like it, we've mentioned, he's more of the people person, but he's he also is like much more like fearful and nervous. Um, just gonna mention this. Uh, I was very surprised when I learned that it was Ria Kugamiya playing uh, Uchida, because when I think Ria Kugamiya, I'm thinking Tsundaris, <laughs> not not this. So like like that actually took me for a back. But when but when I l- listened through her reel of like some of the other things she did is like, okay, I guess I can see it now. She's kind of got that like anime lisp quality uh, to Uchida. 
But like this, this isn't the Shanna. This isn't the Luis. This isn't the Nagi from uh, Hayate no Goku. It so it was like it, it came out of left field for me. <laughs> um, on the other hand, Hamamoto plays a much bigger role in this film. Um, she's I don't want to call her like the female analog of um, uh, the female analog of Aoyama. She's similar in many ways. She's research minded. She's good at chess. Uh, they're reading the same books. Blah 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 blah. She's reading relativity theory in fourth grade. Okay, I'm okay. I'm going to stop you right here. What she is definitely reading is a popular science account, like the kind you would get in like Scientific American or whatever. Uh, oh, okay. she, there is no way that she is has learned enough about, at the very <laughs> least, multivariable calculus and differential geometry to do actual relativity. <laughs> um, which I don't think is that weird, right? If you're like sci- if if you gave like young me, like eight year old Ian, a copy of uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, I'd read that. I would, probably would have devoured that. I, th- I think it's. I think so. I, my assumption is that this is mo- is one of those popular accounts, because I mean, at the same time, they're only doing fractions in their class. <laughs> but I mean, it is the sort of thing that you're interested in. Like th- they're too young not to know that this is too advanced for them or something. I mean, her whole deal is that she's got a crush on Aoyama, and she's kind of jealous when uh, whenever he pays attention to the lady. Like she doesn't want to involve her because she wants to keep Aoyama to herself. And at the same time, when at some point Ayama goes, you know, this might be dangerous. We should talk to the adults, which kids barely do in child children's movies. She's like, no, I don't. This is our research. I don't want to share it with them. Because it is kind of her main link to Ayama. Because they didn't really seem to talk all that much before they started this research in the forest. Like, I, I think that this was a good excuse for her to, like, rope him in. The fact that she had found this thing in the woods. Also, like, you're saying that earlier that Aoyama is taking after her after his dad. This is certainly true of Hamamoto, whose dad is a researcher in meteorology at the local university, wherever that is. Uh, she's kind of uh, a bit one-note. Yeah. Um, like This was the same problem we had with Shoko last week in um, The Portrait mm. of Tea Gazette. I think it worked better there. She's got this fascination with Aoyama and this is what sort of motivates all of her interactions with him is the like, why don't you come to the the festival? I'll be wearing my yukata, yutaka, yukata, yukata. <laughs> it's a bit of a disconnect because it's uh, like Ariam is the narrator and he obviously uh, can't tell that she's got a crush on him. But in a in a meta sense, we know, uh, which makes it a bit odd. But at the same time, I, I feel like most of the other characters know as well. Yes, like. The lady certainly it's does. It's weird because we've got this like love love rectangle, so to speak, in the Aoyama is interested in the lady, Hamamoto is interested in Aoyama, but also the, the bully Suzuki is interested in Hamamoto. And none of the kids realize that the other person is interested in them. But one of the things that distinguishes the lady is she's like, yeah, <laughs> I understand the situation. <laughs> I mean, should we talk about the lady then? Because... While she is like one of the central characters, we really don't know that much about her. It would it would it would be entirely wrong to describe her as the manic pixie dream girl, but I feel that she's accomplishing a similar role in the narrative, which is that she's the mysterious figure who is beautiful and uh, something strange is as so there's something off about her, but we're fascinated, and this is motivating the change in the main character. But she doesn't need to be there that much to do it because Aoyama can let his imagination run wild himself. Mm. Yes. This seems to be a shared thread in most of Mariami's work. Ben 10, uh, the lady, uh, the love interest in Tatami Galaxy, and Night is Short, Walk on Girl, they're all mostly unobtainable figures to the main character of uh, their respective show, but they are the object of fascination until eventually the main character mostly moves on from them. I don't know how accurate that is towards uh, the Tommy Galaxy and a short, a short walk on golf, right? Well, they're handled quite differently. Uh, for a start, Otome and a uh, short walk on goal basically is the main character. Mm. Uh, she drives most of the uh, plot and events. Akashi and the Tommy Galaxy is kind of like this. Uh, she's a lot more down to earth than uh, uh, Ben 10 or uh, this person, though. 
Like, I mean, she functions okay in that role, but, like, that role necessitates a certain amount of detachment from the main plot and just to appear, and just to appear periodically to remind her that there's this mystery that they're working towards uh, unsolving. <laughs> I do feel that she's very likable as a just a, a character whenever she's on screen, just in the chemistry between her and Ayama. She's fun to watch, which is good in these kinds of characters. Like Ben 10 was also just fun to watch whenever she was on screen. Yes. And I appreciate the way she treats Ayama, like because she clearly knows he's got a crush on her, but she always kind of just teases him gently, and it's never really a mean spirit way, or she also doesn't really encourage him all that much. She just kind of treats him like a little brother. Well, the most basic interaction, right, is every time she sees him, it's like, Ara, shown in. <laughs> and she's just like, literally just like, hey, kid, yeah. sup. Um, Does the Japanese version of God of War have Kratos screaming, Shonen! Shonen. Something else I appreciate is the fact that, while the mystery exists in the film, um, it, the film is not one of those mysteries where you can't solve it before the characters, or you couldn't. Because all of the clues are there, and you can easily put most of it together before Ayama can. Like, each of the individual points is very well stated on screen. Like, the connection between Penta and the lady is quite obvious to the audience, like, probably more so than uh, to Ayama because he's directly involved in it. In one scene, she makes food for the both of them, but when you go back and watch it again, you realize that she doesn't actually eat any of the food, even though he does. And uh, that was just something else I appreciated about the movie. But all the same about the mystery, I would say that like it doesn't really have like a very satisfying maybe uh, resolution, which in the it leaves quite a lot up in the air. So it's like, well, what is this other world? Who knows? I think that's fine. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. What what? How is this world like related to the the main world? It doesn't really get resolved. How can, is it that penguins of all things are destroying the barrier between the worlds? Who knows? Um, and yeah, I don't think it makes too much of a difference to our enjoyment of the film, but this was just something that I was, I was, I got to thinking about is just how many things that are described as science fiction really have like basically no scientific basis whatsoever. <laughs> uh, especially because I was, th I was thinking back and, um, like the disease that Aoyama suggests Suzuki has, he calls like Stanislav's disease. And it's clearly a shout out to uh Stanislav Lem, the science fiction author. And yes. authors during that time, science fiction authors, like really cared about doing things that could work. Kind of. But before but before you reply, I do want to mention one other connection between them, which is the Stanislav Lem's most famous novel, Solaris, which I think sucks ass, but that's neither here nor there, <laughs> is about people on a different planet and the ocean is sentient. Uh where so we've got this sentient bubble of water kind of, uh, called The Sea. Uh, so there's that connection as well. Well, actually, one of the reasons it might make so little sense is because we should consider this science fiction, quotation marks, from a child's point of view. Yeah. And that he, you can make very large, loose connections, but when you go behind it, as you said, they don't really know how it works. He just sees the logical chain of relations. He makes like, ah, that's how it must be. It's science fiction kind of from a child's point of view. The thing is, is that like mainstream science fiction since the seventies has more been more influenced by um, Star Wars, which is influenced by Flash Gordon and um, uh, John Carter and things like that, more in the like science fantasy vein. I mean, you're you're one hundred percent right, Danny, but it's more that we don't really have uh, that much like quote unquote hard sci fi in uh, mainstream stuff anymore. I mean, would anything have changed if the if the answer for this in this movie was just it was magic? A wizard did it? No. No. <laughs> yes. A wizard a wizard did it. That's that's what the, yes. And I uh, like I'm I'm not making a complaint about this movie in specific. I'm just I, it's just it it strikes me just how how little like real science fiction there is. <laughs> real science fiction. <laughs> real science fiction. Particularly in anime where it's like where when in, by real science fiction I don't necessarily mean something that necessarily has scientific explanation but like in theory could be explained in a way consistent with the world Planetary hmm. is the only example I could think of like I mean I would also give like something like Psychopaths a pass here uh. in the in the it's not great but I can I can see how to make that world work it requires 
tremendous leaps of of logic, but it I think it, it could be made to work. If you're gonna let psychopaths in, then like uh, Ghost in the Shell and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, a lot of cyberpunk, I, I give a pass on mm-hmm. um, for this reason. The thing that you're saying about kids, though, is I think quite right in that there's. A conspiratorial logic to it, right? mm-hmm. in that in that you're allowed to make these wild leaps as long as they kind of feel right, in like a narrative sense rather than a a physical sense, and like that's not that's not bad. It was just specifically because they gave uh, Stanislav Lem this <laughs> shout out that I that, <laughs> that I was feeling, man, we need more hard sci-fi anime. <laughs> I mean, another reason uh, before we move on, another reason this might be could be from the question of whether this all actually happened or whether this was uh, all just kind of Aoyama's, like their imagination, their big summer adventure. I personally do not believe in that at all. Like it makes no sense if this was not real because there are scenes where the lady is literally talking to other characters that aren't children. So I'm totally believe uh, in the camp this literally happened. You, you, you. You could make the argument that he's just projecting a bunch of uh, imaginative feelings onto somebody as he crush on. But uh, quite aside from that, there's a whole bunch of scenes where uh, people get run down by penguins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the news and Merevimentia stuff is happening. There is the flooding through the town at the end. Something's definitely happened. The Jabberwockies. The Jabberwockies. The scientists clearly are, are gone and then remember being in a location. Well, maybe they just got lost in the woods in the typhoon. I mean, the, the new city, oh, maybe it was all a shared mass hallucination. It was a gas leak. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that explanation at the end, I was like, okay, yeah, that's how you make this work, is, <laughs> is, how, is you apply Harry Potter logic. Just it, It's all gas leaks and mass hallucinations. What do you mean? All we saw was a crashed weather balloon. <laughs> and it's and like I get how for everyone outside of the town that would be easy to believe, but no one in the town could possibly believe that. Yeah, it's the sad Kennedy secret. Yeah. So like before we go on to like talk about like visuals and sound and stuff, there's one thing that I definitely think we could mention, which is that since we've referred to this as a coming of age story. How well do you think it functions as that sort of a story? Like, how does the, how does this like impact him growing up and like reflect how he he turns the adult he is going to turn into? Uh, pretty well. Uh, the penguins serve in a, a there. The penguins serve as like a stand-in for um, childish projecting the extraordinary onto the uh, real world and all that, and him having to let go of the lady at the end. Mm. I really hate calling her that. <laughs> <laughs> Him having to let go of a Nesan, because that's what they call her in Japanese, uh, is like a good, okay, I have to let go of this stuff, while also sort of going into the, you know, eventually people like move away and you have to let go of shit in your uh, life as a kid. It's also very like standard coming-of-age children's film. Mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like there's like half of it where I think it does work and half of it where I don't think it works. So in in moving on from um, the lady and these this sort of idea of being able to like move beyond someone you're interested in and like realizing that some things just aren't meant to be, I think they did a pretty good job of that. They also kind of do that with his sister a little bit, even though it's a little out of place when this we have his sister come in in the middle of the night and she's just realized. Uh, about mortality. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a very odd scene. It's like, is mommy going to die? Yeah, and like that's like a very important like uh, thing in any human's life, mm-hmm. obviously. But yeah. um, so I think they hit that sort of a note very well. But there is a sense in which I I think that it failed a little bit. There's this cute thing that they do where the ending and the beginning kind of reflect one another in that it's told as a monologue kind of like we had with Miss Hoekstai, where we get the opening narration about like, oh, I'm this super cool dude who's badass and into science and women will love me. And then he's kind of a little bit like that at the end still, in that he still seems to think that he's going to be able to resolve this mystery and become like the famous scientist. Like, I, 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 like, uh, I, I assume he's given up on the Nobel Prize, <laughs> which, he, which, which he fantasized about halfway through the movie. Yeah. But he still keeps returning to there. That's interesting because I actually quite like that as the end of his narrative art. We start 
with him at the beginning of the movie giving this speech. And then we actually get to know him a little bit. We see him softening over the course of the movie because people don't dramatically grow up in like one radical burst. It's 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 the little thing that that changes at the end where he talks about his part. He now has a personal belief that the future is going to be there for him and he's going to run down this highway. And I like that, that it's not, he's not suddenly, oh, he's grown up, he's mature, he's abandoned his childhood dreams. No, he's basically, he's still mostly the same person. It's just, he's softened a little bit. He's a little more, more rounded out. He's had one or two experiences that have changed him as a person, but he's still the same person uh, underneath. So I actually think that works really well. Yeah. There's the telling. There's the telling part where he looks out of the window of the cafe and he thinks he sees a penguin, and then he runs out and it's just a cat. Mm. <laughs> Though he does find the uh, the spaceship they previously threw into the sea, so maybe he will actually find the ladies in the future. Who knows? Unlikely, and it would kind of ruin the message of the film. But maybe. Maybe. <laughs> penguin Highway Two: The Search for the Search for the Lady. So I didn't. I didn't like the ending monologue, but the scene at the end where he's like saying goodbye is like a really touching moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do that, that, that like favorite trick of directors where like the lady is going to disappear and then she like waves goodbye and then they cut to the face of the guy and then they come back and she's gone. <laughs> yeah. Directors really love that trick, the, 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 which I guess sidesteps the episode of uh, the, uh, the issue of how she's going to get back to her world. I'd like to imagine just a bunch of penguins showed up and pecked her until she imploded. Because as far as we knew, this no, no, this was the only like gateway between the two worlds, and the penguins have destroyed it. So how does she get back? I don't know. Like maybe she maybe she's actually still in the world and has just like <laughs> ran and got a train out of there. He's <laughs> like, oh, I hope he doesn't go to the next city over because oof, that would be awkward if he found me there. <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. Just the remaining like little bit of a uh, thing that hadn't closed yet. She went through that. You can explain it why. Yeah. So, so I, I guess I talked a little bit about directing tricks there. But so, but we so now would be a good time to like move on to talk about the visuals, unless there's anything that we feel that we missed. Uh, there, there's um, one or two more things I want to say about the themes of the film. Uh, one of the things that I actually quite like is when we have. Western kids film, generally the adults tend to be very distrustful and it's kind of an us versus them narrative where you go to the adults and they maybe believe you in the beginning, but then whatever you were trying to show them is gone or they don't believe you. You're just like, yeah, honey. Yeah, that's fun. That's nice. Kind of like remember how in knowing when um, when she returned home to her mother and was like, oh, yeah, I always dreamed of something special happening when I was younger. But here the adults are all very kind of helpful. They're mostly just encouraging the children on how to see the world. Like uh, Aoyama's father is not, ah, well, what the hell are you talking about? This is could never happen. This is all just bullshit. But, but instead he tries to like give him some advice on how this might make sense. The same with uh, Hamamoto's father, who is like mostly very supportive of her. And uh, that was something I really enjoyed, but it's also something we kind of see more in... Um, Japanese movies because I because uh, I saw uh, my neighbor Totoro last week. There too, the father was mostly very supportive of the supernatural beliefs of his um, young children. Okay, I will say this though: they were very like shtum about what the research they were doing was to the adults. Um, but like as a general point, yes, like he, like he, he might say to like maybe he doesn't think his father will believe him. Uh, or like it seems unscientific to talk about penguins bursting giant floating balls of water or whatever. But then the adult is, but he, yeah, you're right. He is just like, well, if you're stuck on a problem, write out everything you know on a bunch of paper and then just stare at it every day. And then like try not to think about it except for during that certain time. And then ideas just start to form in your head. That's just, that's the Eureka moment. That's how. That's how people actually do think about hard things, is they just let it simmer for a while. <laughs> the real like problem with what you said, Denny, is that although they're okay with adults, they're not okay with scientists. <laughs> Ironically. <laughs> because the idea is always like, well, we can't reveal the existence of the lady to Hamamoto's father or whatever, because they're like gonna like lock her up and do experiments on her and that and 
yes, we live in a horrible world where people, where human experimentation has happened, but I'm not really sure that like that's what would have happened in this case. Maybe I'm maybe I'm project maybe I'm projecting as an academic. <laughs> but it kind of still makes sense as a childish reaction to that. Because yeah. the science he sees in his books is about dissecting things and like breaking them down and learning from the small things. So it only makes sense that if he finds like this big new interesting mysteries that he assumes, oh, in my books when they found big new things, they broke it down into their smaller components to figure out how it worked. So now he's just projecting that onto the lady and he's afraid that they'll take her away from him to bring her somewhere else to do research like the 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 the, the frame the way the scientists are framed it does not uh like definitely lends to the evil scientist part. <laughs> so uh you mentioned ghibli penguin highway is kind of structured like a um classic children's coming of age film including some ghibli movies like uh kiki or uh Totoro, I guess. So you have the the supernatural elements representing the kids' uh, imagination and exploration of the world. You have the uh, the shared summer project with other kids of them trying to figure it out. Uh, you have the mysterious whimsical character who I don't know. I, for some reason, I can't think of an example from a Western film. Sloth in the Goonies or something like that. Adult says, like, this is very minimal in this film, but Somewhat as like misguided obstacles without really being like evil. Uh, you have the fallout uh, between characters in the third act, and you know, at the end, you have to let go of the supernatural element and go back to normal as your coming of age moment. So, uh, this is uh, this just got me thinking of how um, Tomohiko Monimi is very good at switching up the um, narrative structure of his works uh, to fit the themes. Um, so in Tatami Galaxy, you have this um, episodic uh, time loop structure of each, uh, I guess they're probably chapters in the book, but um, episodes uh, focusing on a different uh, set of hijinks the main character gets into, and then it loops back and he does all garbage again in the next episode so it's like representative of like the uh main character being trapped in his house and his like self-hating oh no what if i did that what if i did that what if i did that this year instead of what i actually did and then for a night short work on gold it's sort of i called it a pub crawl structure <laughs> of like um four little mini adventures rolling into each other which i think fits quite well with like the uh Things of being adventurous while you have the time and appreciating things as they come, but uh, versus uh, having a goal and all that. Um, and then Eccentric Family is like structured in like a semi episodic way of like uh, Yasaburo, the main character, hanging out with people, getting into hijinks again, uh, all like again uh, structured around them trying to like get away from the melancholic uh, family tragedy drama underneath that uh, which is like quite good for the uh again recurring theme in all of his works is appreciating uh little the little adventures you have in life but also this one sort of brings in elements of the danger of escapism uh and also family connections are very important again just watch eccentric family it's good somebody described it as like uh uh, modern Shakespeare, and it's a bit like that, I guess. It's way better than Shakespeare, though. Mm. I mean, it's certainly more entertaining. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I'd say so. I, w I was reading Shakespeare while I was watching this, and I definitely enjoyed Eccentric Family more than Shakespeare. That's because you're an uncultured swine. So no, I don't particularly like <laughs> Shakespeare. Uh, and then for uh, Penguin Highway, he's gone with this um, classic coming-of-age children's story, which uh, Ghibli's also done a bunch of times. Yeah, so um, one of the things, uh, just to bring it back to Ghibli again for a second, is that, so I was, I was reading an article on Sakaga blog about Studio Col um, Colorido, and one of the things that Caven was saying on there was that a lot of the times we want to call something the next Ghibli, and the way studios try to do that is to like try and recreate the sort of like dynamic duo nature of uh, Takahata and Miyazaki. And they were suggesting that maybe the this is actually a bit more appropriate in this case, um, pointing to the, the collaboration between uh, the director, Hiroyasu Ishida, uh, and uh, Yojiro Arai, who was one of the storyboarders, uh, unit director, character designer for this, and so on. Yeah. Does that mean Imaishi and Nakashima are the next Ghibli? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, no, that's a hot take. <laughs> that is hot take. <laughs> I don't think that we've got 
a ton to say about this in terms of its like visual stuff. There was like it was very competently done. I'm I'm actually quite impressed that this was Studio Colorido's first feature length film. Obviously, they'd done smaller mm-hmm. things before. Everybody listening should go and watch their first shot. It's very good. And and why not watch Pokemon Twilight Wings? Right? I mean, they certainly live up to their namesake, Colorado. Like it's really they've got a great sense of color in um, the entire movie. Like it, everything really kind of stands out. The character designs, the lady with a big yellow shirt, the penguins of the black and white obviously stand out from the backgrounds. The backgrounds are the anime in general is very warm. Yeah, uh, in most of the scenes. They do the little, like, forest pathways that the uh, kids and penguins go down really well. It's just, like, the atmosphere of them and how, how green everything is and all the little details. When you're, it, it does feel like the sort of pathways you end up going down as a kid if you go exploring, if you do that. Yeah, yeah, I, I used to do that when I was younger because we lived quite close to a bunch of forests. But do you have anything on the director file? Yeah, so uh, Hiri Ishida is interesting. Quote, unquote, scouted very early. While he was um, a student at Kyoto Seika University, he produced two award-winning uh, short films, Fumiko's Confession, which um, is on YouTube and has about 5 million views, I think, and his graduation project, Rain Town. Uh, these are very uh, distinct from each other. Fumiko's Confession is, like... Silly, exuberant, and playing around with the character, moving really quickly through three um, D space, which is a recurring, which is a recurring element in uh, most of his projects. Whereas Rain Town is this like quiet, melancholic uh, exploration of a um, a gloomy and wistful um, environment. Th- this sort of movement comes across during like a few key scenes here. Like when Hamamoto yeah. like introduces them to her like secret, like you get like the the lift up of the the like the the camera like follows them as they runs and then like overtakes them a little bit and then we see them going into the forest near the end. Mm-hmm. This scene with the like wave of penguins, which goes on for quite a while. <laughs> it's very similar in a way to one of the things they did in their uh, Sunny Boy and Dewdrop Girl uh, short film, uh, with the with the guy on the bird. Yeah. Like, I called it a magic carpet ride because it's kind of the big motion scene. Like, how the cat bus is in Neighbor Totoro, where there's just everything's moving, and you do this kind of big traversal through everything that you've had before. You show all of the things you've seen, you go to the big narr- big action climax, and then you have the narrative resolution after that. I'm not I'm not a big fan of these running climaxes, but I, I was not unhappy with it. <laughs> Uh, it was definitely like the the centerpiece of the film. Like they plastered it all over the marketing. Um, and like I said, Ishida loves doing these. I guess uh, something that will have helped them to do this scene is that the, I believe they work entirely digitally. Uh, Studio yes. Colorado. Yeah, you can watch you you can watch some videos on YouTube of their process, and, and it does seem to be entirely digital. I think they made the decision fairly early to be entirely digital because yeah, Ishida was used to working with it and a lot of their artists were. Uh, is that good or bad? I don't know. Uh, it seems to have worked out pretty well in most of their productions. Honestly, the most important thing about the studio to me is that it was founded on the basis of uh, having a healthy working environment for the artists. Uh, and in particular from insulating them from the um, many of the problems that the industry uh has at large. This was a consequence of Koji Yamamoto, who used to be the chief editor of the uh, Noitamina block on uh, Fuji TV, uh, which was supposed to be like a uh, space for um, uh, more creatively out there anime, which it's sort of dwindled away from a bit in recent years, and maybe that's why he left it. It did, it did have quite a reasonably successful run of, do, of doing uh, exciting it did. stuff. Like who? Like where else would people get see Kuchu Barenko? <laughs> <laughs> and um, or, or 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 Tatami Galaxy or Princess Jellyfish or or Rakugo. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the block produced a lot of great stuff. Also notable um, for their famous uh, Noi Termina intro with the um, the girl on the chair. Uh, that is from a short that uh, Studio Colorado produced for them. Paulette's chair. They do quite a few commercials. They consider it to be part of their uh, thing, which is fine. Uh, their commercials are usually pretty good. 
Um, some of the, I mean, one of the other things we haven't really talked about at all is the penguins themselves. They are animated quite nicely. One of my favorite little jokes in the movie is that at the very beginning, when you have the people lining up the penguins, that they march single file into the truck and they all have their hands up like they're being arrested. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Uh, penguins do kind of do that in real life. It's funny. Not so much the hands up, but like the single file marching. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's how you get the pen the titular penguin highways because they all walk yeah. down the same track and thus create a beaten path. Uh and we can't mention any of the penguin animation without talking about that a lot of the penguins are transforming into it out of other things, and those are generally done pretty well. Uh particularly during this climax when uh the lady is walking and just things are turning into penguins all around her. Okay, it's a great scene to watch. Also, yeah. I just want to give a shout out that we have a penguin in Thanos Circus in this movie, which <laughs> makes me happy. How do we feel about the uh, Jabberwocks? Uh, I, mean, wow. <laughs> I kind of wish it had just been kind of whales, because we see whales at some other point. So if you'd created like whales that come out and eat things, that, that would oh, have been really Whales better. don't eat penguins, leopard seals That's do. True. Uh, or, yeah, or like an orca, I guess. I don't know. I, I just felt it. it... I, re I remember when I saw the film in the cinema and uh, when the, the scene of the one coming across the river and it has like human body parts coming out of it. It was a little unexpected. I wasn't expecting that from the film. That was a nice spooky moment. But outside of that, they don't really do very much. Yeah, I would. I, I like the design of the Jabberwocks, but I do feel like they were kind of that I kind of when they showed us like the actual like image the like Lewis Carroll um I'm forgetting the uh artist's name like Tennille or something uh the one who does the art for the the Alice in Wonderland books like we see the picture of the Jabberwocky from that and I'm like oh my yes we're gonna get the Jabberwocky we get the Jabberwocky and it's like no we got like a weird hippo thing which I also loved especially the one that was like the baby one that they had in the tank that was kind of adorable, even though it had like a hand sticking out of it. Yeah. And on another note, it's been a while, but we do actually get to complain about the water in this movie. It's mostly pretty good. Like the sphere itself looks fine. But at the very end, once the sphere explodes and kind of rushes through town, it's this awful CG liquid that, that looks just bad compared to every other bit of water in the movie. Uh, I'll, I'll give them points for the ambition of the scene where the town is being flooded. Like it, it was a very good attempt. <laughs> this was the as this was their first um, feature length production. They did run into uh, scheduling pro scheduling problems, mm. like um, animates all the time. So they're not completely insulated from problems, and they did have to outsource part of the film to Studio Wit, which is not good because that studio is a very bad environment for its animators. But maybe we'll talk about it different. Time. How do you feel about the uh, the other side world? The the other side world was interesting just because it kind of only like half existed, <laughs> which I thought was very good. But like once you get into the town, although the proportions are all weird, like I said, it has this non -Euclid non Euclidean nature to it. It just kind of felt like a Mediterranean town, and so <laughs> that made me feel a bit weird. The other side is just the Mediterranean. <laughs> I, I quite like the fact that it looks like a video game that's not been finished designing yet. There's houses floating everywhere. There's like places where the house should clearly touch like the ground. There's just void that you can look into. You see the sky underneath and things are just floating. It all feels very unfinished and like put together very quickly. There's a huge seam in this, uh, the middle of it. Uh, they have this mm. shot where the like camera pans around and it, they, you get to the seam and then the other, on the other side they're like reversed. That was cool. That was a good shot, yeah. But I think with that, we've kind of talked about most of the thing I want to talk about. So let's quickly wrap up the music, because I don't think we have too much to say on that. I mostly just thought it was fine. There wasn't really any big standout thing that I noticed. The composer is, um, this is their only uh, soundtrack credit. They're otherwise, like, do their own music. The most famous person involved... <laughs> in this film, probably, is uh, Hikaru Utada, who did the credits theme. Uh, I mean, you can't see me, but I'm shaking my fist. Uh, not at this, but at Kingdom Hearts, just because, of course, because I have to. She's done so many more things than just Kingdom Hearts, but Denny will always feel the need to bring up Kingdom Hearts because he sucks. You could you could have you could have just not mentioned it. I refuse to. We've invested so much time into this. 
like I could I could equally well mention like all of her work in like Evangelion or her many yeah. albums of music. Yeah. She's as far as like singers and anime go, like she's I, it would be wrong to say that this is this is like the singing equivalent of getting Yoko Kano as a composer. <laughs> uh, oh boy! But, now that's now that's a hot take. <laughs> um, but I definitely oh, but, only with but less I, plagiarism. <laughs> but I don't mean this in the sense of like technical ability, but in terms of like prestige. It's a name yeah. that like is instantly recognizable and that like will garner approving nods from a certain mm. kind of anime fan. Like the ending song was kind of nice, but I've already forgotten it. But yes. we've, but it wasn't a very impactful one. But it it, it made sense that this was that they got um they got her to do it. Yeah, sound sound didn't play as 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 big of a role in our evaluation of this film as uh, sometimes it does. Ian, how many penguins are on the penguin highway? That might have been the worst transition we've ever had. Good job, Freya. <laughs> yes. Well, there are an average amount of penguins on the Penguin Highway. I'm thinking that this show for me is, it's pretty solid. We're talking three, three and a half out of five. As a rule, although I tend to watch them more than I think either of you, I tend to actually be pretty down on coming of age stories. <laughs> but I've, I've bounced through with the film and I enjoyed it as I watched it, but it didn't make the biggest impact on me. It's the sort of thing that if someone like says to me, Ian, like in a, a, a year down the road, what did you think of it? I'll be like, I, I, I mostly enjoyed it. It was fine. And so it gets a fine score. Uh, let, let's let's say three out of five. How about you, Freya? Uh, I'm in a similar position of thinking that it was mostly solid, but I didn't really care. Part of that is that <laughs> the characters, although I think Aoyam was well-rounded and like well-handled, I didn't really care about him. And his whole, like, the whole like children's perspective on things it just wasn't a particularly interesting version of that having said that should knock the movie too much uh so i will give it three and a half as for me i actually enjoyed this movie quite a lot maybe it is because as ian said i don't watch that many coming of age stories so when i see one like this uh it kind of sticks with me a little more I really liked the color work of the movie, and I actually quite enjoyed Aoyama as a character. I was initially a bit worried when we get to the whole bully stuff, but he deals with that really well. Looking back on the film, now we've talked about it for like an hour and a half, there isn't really anything negative I had to say about the film at all. Maybe there was one or two scenes that could have been better integrated or so, but when I think back on it, there was, there was never a moment where I thought, oh, this didn't work, or I didn't enjoy this moment. So I'm actually think I'm gonna give this a uh, a four. Uh, I'm not gonna give it a five just because it feels like it could be many other growing up childhood movies. As you said, it follows a very traditional ch Japanese children's movie formula, and there wasn't really that special something that I felt with Uchida and Casco or Night is Short Walking Girl in um, Morimi's other work. But I still enjoyed it quite a lot. It is the weakest uh, Morimi adaptation I've seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, personally, I just... I know Tatami Galaxy is good, I just can't watch it because it just... I get too much second-hand embarrassment for some reason from that. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Uh, does anybody have any trivia? Usually I have the trivia, but I don't have any this week. Well, this is one of those interesting cases where um, our leads are played by people who aren't typically uh, anime voice actors. Like, obviously, Ria Kugamiya played Uchida. She's been in way too much stuff to list even though I, I i tried a little bit earlier but uh for hanakita who plays aoyama this is her only anime role uh she's not a voice actress at all uh for you aoi she's been the occasion she's been in the occasional anime like uh, uh han and dallas or redline uh but she's mostly an actress or a model i actually think that in this case uh hamamoto is the most famous because we have uh megami han who has gone from hunter x hunter well most famous except for Riku. so i couldn't f i, I, for I so i forgot to fit that in when we were talking about sound that would have been a good place to put it but i do have another fact which is that apparently um was that for arai uh who we've already talked about was uh actually contacted for a job through his pixiv by <laughs> uh, ishida which just amused me very much. Um, although it's probably more likely to happen now than any other time in history. So, yes. So, 
Freya, what will we be watching next week? Well, um, we did a, a Shimbo series of OVAs, and now we're going to do a Mamoroshi series of OVAs with mm. Gozen So Sama Ban Ban Zai. Was this the first time we've done Oshi on the podcast? Yes. I think so. Technically, I mean, he was technically involved a little bit in Windy Tales, but uh, this is the first time he's like properly involved in something else. Hmm. Well, that'll be interesting. We are the Anime Research Group, a weekly podcast coming out every Thursday, more or less. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Goodbye. Banzai. <laughs>